cognitive enterprise has taken place as also the, it affects the manner in which structures in the university system as also in the school system have been made thanks to these perceptions. At the same time, there were voices in Europe. They came quite early, frankly, because as soon as Cartesian dualism and the entire bundle of binary opposites were placed. The Industrial Revolution had taken place. We know what the Age of Enlightenment was, again, merely telegraphic reminders. We also know that there were voices, voices which was disturbance from within, the voice of a Blake, a voice even of a Wordsworth, a voice of a Keats, a voice later of many other poets and writers. And those voices continued till the 19th century or even in the 20th century. That is, in, within Europe itself, there were these two very clearly identifiable movements one movement, which was the progressive movement, what you call the linear progressive movement. The other, which has been termed today as the universalist movement, and going on from Blake to the poet Kathleen Rain, and not to speak about Prince Charles today. So it is not to say when we say Western, we cannot make one monolithic category at all, because within Europe itself, there was this dialogue. And it is against this dialogue that the subject of what, especially this last word that I have used in my title, skill, becomes important. It was in 1882, and I've skipped a great deal of this 18th century, that we have a movement, a movement spearheaded by two people Eric Gill on the one hand, and later A.K. Kumaraswamy on the other. And Eric Gill writes, what is art? Art is first and foremost the art of living. The art of living is the basic art. And then this little book which I would recommend to the CCRT for I think the teachers and teacher training courses that you have, it is called The Holy Tradition of Working. And the Holy Tradition of Working draws attention to the bifurcation of the brain and the hand, the mind the, and what has happened in the breakdown of the relationship of the hand, the heart, and the head, or say the heart, the head, the hand, the head, and finally the heart and soul. In my own involvement at the CCRT, if the former director, Dr. Prem Puri will remember, there was a logo of this institution, which is called the Thinking Hand. A film was also made, which I never saw, but that's another matter. To quote Mr. Gill, the word skill does not merely mean well done, it means well made. And when we say that a person does his work skillfully, we mean that his very action is a thing to be seen, a thing which we can admire in itself, a work of art, a thing made, but a thing made with value. And we momentarily forget the purpose of this action, 
though only momentarily. Otherwise, however skillful the action would be, it would become meaningless if the value in the thing continued not to communicate. This is also the time when there is a certain amount of writing on Indian art. And that is another contemporary and almost concurrent. And that history is well known and documented and also written about in the historiography of Indian art. I do not have to give you a very full account of it because Parthamitra has given a very fine account of the understanding of Indian art in his remarkable book, The Much Maligned Monsters. And I think that portions of that book also should be read by people because it tells you what the perceptions on Indian art were from that side. And I don't have to spell it out. But where it becomes relevant, because it is at that moment when Indian art is on the one hand being acquired, it is also the same time when excavations are being done in Amravati. It is also the same time when Bharut has been looked at. It is also the same time that explorations on Indian art are done. And it is the same time when that same art is interpreted in the manner as it is. So these are two concurrent things that are going on. And we have to address ourselves to this, that what was it that brought forth these monuments to our attention? And what was it that was being done? Because all of this tradition, there was only one. And much as we are grateful, and I am grateful, and B.M. Pandey is here, and he knows the history better than I would, of each of these excavations and the manner in which this art was looked at, but not the manner in which it was interpreted. Thus arose a great controversy, a great controversy of what Partho calls the much maligned monsters headed by a birdwood and the lashing replies of Sri Aurobindo. And one has to read that. We only talk about all very nice exhibitions today. I have also taken some out. But we do not know this recent history, very recent, I would say, of how this was established or re-established in the perception to understand a tradition on its own terms, through its own terms. And therefore, what was happening in Bengal at that time, most of them were in Bengal, is a most illuminating history. And thanks to Prabir, I refreshed myself even with my half eyes now. Alongside, there was something else that was happening here, and most of you know that. There was a ship called Crocodile. And that ship brought, and Jawad knows all this backwards, forward, so you should be very amused and say that, Kapilaji, now don't tell me what I know. But maybe some of them don't know about the crocodile ship. <laughs> On that crocodile ship came a judge. And the judge was told by someone who was sitting in Fleet Street. And uh, he was also writing letters to the governor general, and he said, you know, you who have been in, in the land of Persia and who brought the riches of Persia, now I hope that you will bring the riches of Ing to uh, Ind to enrich the Isle of Ing. And therefore, when this judge came on this ship, which was interestingly called Crocodile, he was given a copy of Manusmiti so that he could sharpen his own knowledge because he was in the judiciary. So while he was reading the Manusmati, 
became a pundit. And this Ramprasad, who was responsible for, for a great deal, came one day under his uh, armpit with a little manuscript. And this manuscript was what? What? And all of you know this. This manuscript was the manuscript of Kalidas's Abhigyan Shakuntal. <clears throat> so Abhigyan Shakuntal, so William Jones in his uh, uh, late evenings after all this, and he was also a little bored incidentally from his private correspondence, which I have read rather carefully. He thought it would be nice to see, I uh, read some romantic poetry or something like that. So he translated it, he translated it and off it went to Europe naturally. When it went to Europe, Gaete looked at it and he was blown off his feet. He said, ah, and as we all know, much of German romanticism began with the translation of Abhigyan Shakuntal. And many of the images that you find in the poetry of, I as a former teacher of English literature, uh, images that you find of the plumerias and the champak flowers come as a result of those translations. First they went to Italy in some ways and Amru Shatak was also translated and this is a fascinating history of who bought what in which translation from it Italian, French, German. So this was a movement which went then one day Ram Prashad also brought another yet a little book and that little book was what? The Gita Govind. So William Jones translated that also. And somewhere else I have traced that history. Translation by translation and what it did to European poetry and their sensibility in another uh, context. And the title itself will t is, gives away Gita Govind travels west, and the west then travels east. So these were things that were happening at that time. And between 1794 and 1798 to 1803, and then 1833, something else, as I said a minute ago, all this is happening in Calcutta that was, and Kolkata that is. Because then, 1833, Raja Ram Roy writes that great letter to Lord Amherst in about the Hindu college and the introduction of the English language. And if anyone has seen that original correspondence which I have refreshed myself with, and since you're also in charge of the Raja Ram Mohan Roy Library Foundation, in that context, I have traced that history. Raja Ram Mohan Roy wanted the introduction of the English language, but not the replacement of Indian languages. Raja Ram Mohan Roy said that we have enough with us, and as is not well recognized in our critical writing on Raja Ram Mohan Roy. He was a Persian scholar, he was a Sanskrit scholar, he wrote in Arabic and he wrote some of the finest things in Arabic. And we have made a stock image of Raja Ram Mohan Roy by saying that apart from the Renaissance of Bengal, etc., I think we need to look at it, which was the educational philosophy which he was trying to propagate there. And the manner in which that 1835 minute in the House of Lords gives a totally new turn to the educational system of this country is a history which needs to be looked at. And that minute of 1835, remember that 1835 comes only two decades before 1857, because that ferment is also going on. And remember that it is at that time in the late 18th century and the early 19th century. And that we also have the Orientalists who are looking at the Shatpat Brahman, who are looking into the Vedas, and 
Then comes Mr. Max Muller soon after the Raj to do the whole sacred books of the East. And everyone that we know as Indologists, whom we know as Grierson, Colebrook, and on and on and on, and not to speak of. So these are parallel trends that take place in this country. And the vibrant, and I would say much more meaningful, and I'm a member of parliament, debates that take place between the Anglicans on the one hand and the Orientalists on the other. But the fissure takes place because one set of people, the archaeologists, the Indologists, and those who are known as the Orientalists, the anthropologists, the botanists, look at India at a distance and analyze. And the educationists want to bring up an Indian, all that you know very well about brown skin, etc., etc. So that the formal system of education is based on one set of principles. There is another discourse which is going on, and into this is the third and the most important, that there is the vast, vast creativity at what we call, in socio-economic terms, tribal India, village India, rural India. And it is against this background that we have then to turn our attention to not only where I have left off in terms of the 19th century, to draw your attention to 1857, a date which you, we all remember with its two appellations of the mutiny or the war of independence. But soon after the Raj, there is immediately the establishment of 1861, the Archaeological Survey of India, 1866, the Botanical Survey of India, and 18, between 56 and 61, the great education report of Hunter and Wood. And that report really needs a rereading. Because within that report, and as we are so familiar with the setting up of commissions and reports, uh, these days, and I'm also part of that machinery, or have been. That report argues, and I have everything in my text, argues on the one hand, there are, oh, if we educate these Indians, what will happen? They might turn around and start arguing, and then they say, and all this is a little at variance with the established histories of education that I've been reading, that they wanted only clerks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. because there's a lot of ferment that is going on within. And the argument is that, but nevertheless, this will mean that we shall have trained them in a manner in which we will be able to communicate, and then we can also perhaps use them as agents to know more about the country that we're going to be ruling. However, there is then that seminal minute, because in that report, they also talk about that we shall take no cognizance whatsoever, nor give any grants or any financial to the existing systems of education, whether the patshalas or the tolls, or the village craftsmen or anything. And then this last line, 
by not doing so, we shall have shrunk the system that it will shed on its own accord without our being responsible, unquote. That is the history and the heritage that we carry with us. Because gradually but surely, there was shrinking. Shredding, I don't know, because it was an organic plant which could grow anywhere, anyhow, under any circumstances. Today we call it the unorganized sector. Then it was only natural. It is only natural and understandable that men of vision, men of vision 